Hello Year 7, in today's lesson we're going to have a look at modernism. So we've gone from realism through to modernism. Now modernism is quite a broad uh, genre, it's, it encompasses all kinds of things, so literature, art, music, architecture, um, it's huge. But we're going to focus in on something called the stream of consciousness today. So last week we looked at Dickens and we studied um, realism and we learned that Dickens depicted the world very much as it was, which was this idea of um, very similitude, this, uh, the idea that in your writing you would create the most realistic picture possible. Dickens also focused on the everyday, um, which was what we called the quotidian, so he would report back on actual daily life events. But the thing was, Dickens lived in a period of time where things were relatively stable, especially things like social class. Um, there was a, a very structured way of life in the Victorian era that meant that the class you were born into um, and the class that you were raised in really decided your life opportunities largely. Um, in the Victorian period, we were obviously at the height of the British Empire, so towards the middle of the 19th century um, we're looking at countries like India and other countries that were part and part of the empire um, that we had colonized over the course of the early 1800s. So Dickens was writing at a very specific period of time that was largely quite stable and quite solid so in 1914, those of you that know your history will know that in 1914, the First World War broke out and it didn't finish until 1918. It was this period of time that really provided the soil, if you like, the environment in which modernism grew. So previously, we'd had this stability in Britain. Um, things that went wrong or things that happened were abroad. They were in different places and we weren't largely affected by it. We were also um, a powerful unit. We were a powerful country in charge of an empire. But bit by bit, we became less of an empire. We became less powerful. And then by the outbreak of World War One, we were faced with a situation where we had millions of people um, going to fight on the front line. So this was a different kind of warfare than we had experienced thus far in Europe. Um, World War One was accountable for, responsible for around 40 million casualties. And of those, there were around 20 million deaths. And it was more or less half civilians and half military. So this period of time, this is the environment in which modernism flourished. And the modernist artists, so writers, painters, musicians, architects, what they wanted to capture in their work, in their art, was the fracturing of society, the brokenness of the world, the way that things seem to have shattered into pieces. That's what modernism is all about. Nothing is solid and secure anymore. In modernism, it's reflective of the fact that the world in the 20th century broke apart in ways that had not been seen before with World War One. So a word that is frequently used actually by modernist writers, in particular the poets, is the word chaos. And this idea of chaos reigning, of nothing being secure. Now the word chaos etymologically, which means where it came from, um, is an interesting one. And chaos actually um, comes from the old French, which means an abyss. It links into the idea of um, a yawn, actually, a chasm, the sound um, that it originally comes from means to yawn or be wide open, um, a void. So chaos is the whole, if you like, the void, the broken bit that the modernists wanted to fill. So in a sense, they felt that this chasm, this yawning void could be filled and healed in some way through art. So we could bring the world back together and make sense of all of the pieces. If you imagine the world as a jigsaw that had been dropped on the floor, 
Modernism was all about bringing those pieces back together to make some sense. What was interesting was, and you'll see this shortly, in a jigsaw puzzle, you would put the pieces back in the right place. What the modernists said was that they don't have to be in the place they were before. As long as they're attached, as long as they're fixed, they don't have to be in the stereotypically right place. So they filled the gap, they filled the void caused by the chaos of war, the fracturing of society, the modernists filled that gap with art. And it was an art of a kind that had not been seen before. So here are some words um, that link to the idea of chaos that we can have a look at. And you'll see some similarities. So there are three words there that begin with the prefix dis, dis meaning not. So it's this whole idea of being against something, um, of representing something that is not as it should be. The two that are highlighted in red um, I wanted to talk about. So the red one, first one, pandemonium. So I don't know if you knew, but pandemo pandemonium is the name that um, in Paradise Lost, a writer called Milton gave to the palace built in the middle of hell. So that palace that you can see looks slightly like the houses of um, the houses of Parliament, but it's not. But that is an illustration of the palace in the middle of hell that was called pandemonium. And that's because the Greek pan means all. And then the demonium links into the demons. So all of the demons um, were in that building. They were in that palace at the centre of hell. And the other word I wanted to look at was bedlam. So bedlam, um, the bottom picture, is of a hospital. Um, and originally, uh, the word bedlam actually comes from the name of that hospital because that hospital was called the Hospital of, of St Mary of Bethlehem in London and it was founded in 1247 as a priory and then later on in 1402 it became a hospital for um, people who were mentally ill and this um, because in the 1400s places that looked after the mentally ill were not really on a par or anywhere near with the sort of mental health facilities we have in this day and age people associated um, this hospital with chaos, with panic, with um, upheaval and therefore the idea of Bedlam emerged because it was a nickname for Bethlehem or the hospital of St Mary of Bethlehem. So Bedlam initially refers to a place that actually existed. So here are some examples of modern art and um, particularly from the period of time around the turn of the 20th century and this is really what I was saying about the jigsaw so what modernists did as you can see is they put things back together but in a way that made sense to them and it didn't necessarily make sense to other people the art that was created was open to interpretation it was open to the person looking at it so you could look at the picture and you could see what you wanted to see in it you didn't have to necessarily know what it was you were supposed to be looking at and this was all about trying to fill that void so the whole mess that was caused by the fracturing of society and the big chasms that were created between us between each other between us and our history those chasms were filled with the new. People wanted to look forward to the future. Let's create something new. Um, and Ezra Pound, one of the most famous poets of the modernist movement, is quoted as saying, make it new. That was the kind of uh, slogan, if you like, make it new. So here are some examples of making it new. Now, a lot of this work at the time um, would have been viewed as quite shocking and if you think about this in comparison to some of the old masters and the work that was traditionally um, displayed in galleries and in museums the realism um, the realistic uh, grand epic portraits and scenes of battles these are very 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 different but this was modernism
So your task today, the first task is to draw an illustration or an infographic, if you like, of what modernism actually was. So we're going to just go through and make sure that you know the basics and the most important things. So modernism was first and foremost an artistic movement. So it was just like realism. And by an artistic movement, we mean a, a type of art that had things in common across all the different genres of art. So there were writers involved, there were uh, painters, there were sculptors, there were dancers, there were musicians, and there were architects, um, garden designers even. So modernism affected all areas of the creative um, arts. Now, the first thing, modernism represented an intentional, so a deliberate break with tradition. So rather than doing things as they'd always been done, just because it was tradition to paint faces in flesh tones, the modernists broke with that deliberately. It was an intentional turning away from the past and from tradition. Secondly, there was no connection with history or institutions. So modernism was all about looking forward, wasn't interested in looking at the past, wasn't interested in looking at what had gone before or what had led to this point. It was all about turning your back on that and looking to the future. So think about how you might illustrate that. The experience of modernists is largely that of alienation. So the feeling of being alienated, of being separate from other people, a feeling of loss and a feeling of um, despair as well. So their experience was um, a lonely one, partly because they were in a position where they were detached from what had gone before. So if you're no longer connected to history, you're on your own. It's like you're on your own in the abyss. Therefore, fourth point down, um, the modernists were all about championing the individual. They were all about self-belief and the next one down, inner strength. It was all about you being able to do just this, to be brave enough to do your own thing, to be um, strong enough to work on your own and be independent and start new um, trends and employ new styles. Um, and then the last two, the modernists were really concerned with the subconscious. Now, by that, we mean the things that go on in our minds that we aren't consciously aware of. So things that happen in the back of our minds that we um, will be living in the present and will be working through our day. But in our subconscious, there's always things going on and they might be linked into thoughts and feelings. So feelings of fear, feelings of guilt, um, feelings about our past that we try and hide and so on. So the modernists were interested in this in what goes on in the brain underneath everything else. And then finally, the modernists felt that your truth, so your individual truth, was the only truth that mattered. Your truth is the only truth that matters. So when you stood in front of one of those pictures, if you saw a particular thing in that picture, that's all that mattered to them. So let's have a look at the impact that modernism had on literature in Britain. And the impact was huge and it was in stories and in poems. And the thing that hopefully you will notice is the fracturing of language itself, the break with traditions of grammar, with traditions of punctuation and just a completely different way of writing that appeared at this period of time. So this extract is from um, a book called Ulysses, which is by a writer called James Joyce, who was an Irish writer, and he's one of the most famous modernist writers. Um, and this is the reason why. Now, this is also the reason why this uh, extract will show you the reason why not many people have read Ulysses. So let's have a read. It says, after all, there's a lot in that vegetarian fine flavour of things from the earth. Garlic, of course, stinks after Italian. Organ grinders, crisp of onions, mushrooms, truffles. Pain to the animal, too. Pluck and draw fowl. Wretched brutes there at the cattle market, waiting for the poleaxe to split their skulls open. Moo! Poor trembling calves. Meh! Staggering bob. Bobble and squeak. Butcher's buckets. Wobbly lights. 
Give us that brisket off the hook. Plop. Raw head and bloody bones. Flayed glass-eyed sheep hung from their haunches. Sheep snouts, bloody papered, sniffling nose jam on sawdust. Top and lashes going out. Don't maw them pieces, young one. Hot fresh blood they prescribe for decline. Blood always needed. Insidious. Lick it up, smoking hot, thick, sugary, famished ghosts. Oh, I'm hungry. He entered Davy Burns. Moral pub. He doesn't chat. Stands a drink now and then, but in leap year once in four. Cashed a cheque for me once. Now, let's be honest. If you were to write something like that in your English class, your teacher would say to you, where's your punctuation? Where's your structure? Where are your paragraphs? What are you even talking about? Where are your speech marks? Etc, etc, etc. This is modernism for you. This is an absolutely um, perfect example um, of modernism because what this is called is stream of consciousness. Now, what that means is this writer, James Joyce, has let his consciousness, he's let all the thoughts in his head flow out onto the page. Now, they're not they're not as random as they seem like he, he has thought about what he wants to say. And he's thought about the links between the different uh, subjects and topics in this little description. And you can probably work out a little bit of it. So where they might be if there's meat hanging around and smells of food and so on. Um, you might be able to work out some of the things that he's talking about. But the idea is that it doesn't really matter if we can't, because what he wants is to put us into that position where we are reading and we can't really find a story as such. We can't really find a narrator. Even we get flashes of him. We get glimpses of him. So at the end, do you see where it says he entered Davy Burns, which is a pub he entered. Who's he? And where's he come from? He wasn't there for the entire previous uh, description. What there was, was somebody, it seemed like somebody was speaking to somebody else, or it could have been a group of different people speaking. So this is stream of consciousness, and you just let everything in your mind, almost like you're seeing the scene um, all at once, and you let it out onto the page. Now, obviously, Dickens did this too. Dickens was all about capturing the reality of a situation he was all about looking at a a scene and giving every bit of information in detail the modernists were no different but as you can see the way that they share this information is much freer and it's much more um like they've taken thoughts out of their head and just dropped them onto the page it's not structured anywhere near the same as Dickens. It doesn't really have any structure. And that's the point. In their writing, they wanted to show the brokenness, the fragmented nature of society. We don't have, they said, full stops and paragraphs in real life. We don't have semicolons to separate our ideas. We don't have um, connections and sentence starters and discourse markers. Everything just happens at once and it's a mess and it's chaos. And there's lamb over here. There's cows over there. There's chickens. Then you can smell this. Then you can smell that. What they were trying to do was capture real life as it was in a new way that had not been done before. So here's another example before we do our own of a piece of modernist writing. This is T.S. Eliot, and this is from his poem, The Wasteland. Now, in this extract, you'll see he intersperses, he drops in little sounds and moments from outside the conversation that's going on. But there's no indication as to where that noise comes from or who's saying what. So if you listen and see if you can work it out. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to him myself, Hurry up, please. It's time. Now Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get, get yourself some teeth. He did. I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set. He said, I swear, I can't bear to look at you. And no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it to him, there's others will, I said. Oh, is there, she said. Something of that, I said. Then I'll know who to thank, she said, and gave me a straight look. 
Hurry up, please, it's time. That's modernism. How many people are there? Could be two, could be three, could be four. It's up to you. It's up to you to decide how many people you want there. Um, and then you've got the intersp interspersing, the sudden sounds from the background. It's almost like reading a description of a film happening. It's, it's like a, a written word example of something happening live and direct. So they were both examples of what we call the stream of consciousness style. So it's almost like you've turned on a tap at the side of your head and everything that's in your mind, so your thoughts, your conversations, your memories, noises from outside, your emotions, everything comes out onto the page. Now, you're going to have a go at this. In a minute, you're going to write for two minutes and I want you to keep your pen constantly on the paper. So I just want you to write and there'll be times when you've got nothing to say. But you know, if that happens, I want you to write down nothing to say, can't think of anything to say and just keep writing that until something else comes into your head. So put your pen on the paper and start writing whatever is in your head. Just let it out onto the page and you don't need to worry about a thing because you'll, it won't make any sense probably or there'll be all kinds of random things but that's the point and then next lesson we're going to do something with that information that's come out of your head so write what comes into your head don't worry about traditions or patterns or rhythm don't worry about full stops or capitals or punctuation don't worry about sentences don't worry about shapes on the page even just put down what comes into your head as soon as you can notice it in your consciousness and what will be reflected on the page is the natural pattern and rhythm of your individual thoughts and try doing what T.S. Eliot did and intersperse outside sounds and words so you've got to be a bit like Doug I don't know if you've seen the word um, the word the film up the Disney film up no it's Pixar and um there's Doug the dog and every time someone's speaking to him he's listening he's listening and then he suddenly goes <gasps> squirrel because he gets distracted you've almost got to be Doug so write get your thoughts out on the page but then bit by bit when you hear a noise just write it out now it might be a noise that doesn't have a word so my dog has been whining every now and again during this video you probably heard him because he wants my attention I could write the word wine or dog whines but I could also write, um, I don't know, like a load of E's in a row to make an E sound because that's kind of what he sounds like. I'd have to think about it, but my consciousness would tell me. So just write everything out onto the paper. It will feel weird, but stick with it. OK, ready? Absolute silence. Two minutes. I'm going to keep this uh, slide on for two minutes so you know how long it is. Write anything that comes into your head. If you can't think of anything, just write the same word over and over until an idea forms. Don't take your pen off the paper, apart from when you go to a new word. Write, write, write. Write absolutely anything. Repeat words if you need to. If you hear anything, put that in too. Ready? So two minutes, starting from now. Okay, time's up. That was two minutes. So I want you to save what you've got for next lesson on Thursday. So don't do anything to it um, other than this at the top of the page. Write down the exact time that it is now, the exact time and the date. So the time and the date at the top. And this, what you've just written, was an exact recording of your first stream of consciousness piece of writing. This is the first time you have turned the little tap on uh, metaphorically at the side of your head and anything and everything that was in your head has gone onto the page with no rules no punctuation unless you wanted it um, no traditional expectations of writing and I want you to save that for next lesson and we're going to transform it into a piece of modernist art well done I know it's a little bit strange but all will become clear see you later bye